Welcome everyone to episode 40 of Today in the Scene. I'm Joe with Indie Arcade Wave, and this week we're going to dive into an arcade down in Florida. Um, this arcade is called Flynn's Arcade, and they do, it seems like a little bit of everything. Um, you guys host tournaments, you guys do uh, comics, and like you do arcade games. And just, I mean, it, it seems like there's nothing you guys don't do in the arcade nerd right. realm, really. Right. Um, I'm joined by Eddie here. Um, how are you doing today, man? Hey, doing good, bro. It's a nice sunny day here in South Florida, other than the mosquitoes. It's a good day. <laughs> yeah, I will. Uh, I would definitely take that over getting snow in the middle of March in Minnesota. That's <laughs> it's been beautiful the last couple of days. And then we just got a whole bunch of snow and I'm not happy about that. Nah, dude, it was uh, we were with my grandmother this morning or the, yeah, this morning, this afternoon, bro. She has like an ocean view from her condo. And I'm like, man, this is this is crazy. You know, like living here where people where people go on vacation, you know, <laughs> so. right. You're living in paradise, basically. <laughs> Yeah, all my life, all my life. Gotcha. Well, I've been down there to visit a couple arcades, but I really wanted to focus on yours. So okay. um, just tell me a little bit about yourself um, so that I know kind of what you do at Flynn's and just what you do in general. Awesome, dude. Yeah. So I was a teacher for six years. Um, I taught for six years, high school, middle school, that kind of stuff. And then in 2011, you know, got bit by the, hey, let's you know, start a business kind of thing. And, um, the first one was real estate. So I got involved with real estate. I was a real estate or I still am a real estate broker for since 2011. Then a good friend and I, uh, started our own real estate brokerage. That's been going on probably since about, you know, five or six years now. And then, um, you know, I developed a digital media company to go alongside that real estate company. And then when my partner, my business partner and I will, uh, were renovating a house I was selling. I was like, dude, I really think it's it's time, you know, to start this arcade. Uh, people seem to want it. We were doing pop up arcades, which we called retro arcades, um, and we had done about three of them up to that point, and we were drawing anywhere from like two to four hundred people each event, and we were scattering them out, you know, like one a quarter, one every couple months or whatever. And then um, this was December two thousand and eighteen, and pretty much what happened was December two thousand eighteen to uh let's say may 2019 it was just uh building a business plan personas demographics uh getting the the monies lined up understanding you know uh, uh architectural floor plans how we wanted to look conceptual ideas then in july we executed our lease of 29 uh 2019 we executed our lease where we're currently at in margate and uh, we were off to the races. We did the build out entirely, pretty much on our own with contractors, because my partner, Will, his father owns a general contracting company. So he had the experience from it. And then once that happened, we then, you know, did everything we could from July all the way up until December. And December 7th, 2019 is when we opened to the public. And then from December 7th, 2019, all the way till, you know, today. So, so we just celebrated our one year anniversary and it has been one heck of a ride because especially with what's going on in the world around us, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't even imagine that that would be an easy time to do everything you do because there was an arcade here in Minneapolis um, called Northeast Arcade that was doing awesome. They were supporting indies. We were in there with Galactic Battleground and... They seemed like they were getting a lot of traction and then got shut down and couldn't couldn't hang. So they ended up having to close their doors, unfortunately. But I'm glad you guys were able to to make it through the storm. Yeah, dude, it, it's entirely from our Flynn's family, our community. You know, that's what we call it. The Flynn's family. It's a community that helped us. They were the reason why, you know, we were able to make it through. Right. Yeah. I mean, it seems, it seems like you guys have a really active community. I mean, I see you guys posting all the time on Instagram, getting lots of engagement. Yeah. Um, it's, and I it's, saw that yeah. drawing you guys did for the, the convention. That was cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was interesting. Um, so I'm curious about your background in video games, Eddie. Um, when did you get into video games and what are your, what are your, some, some of your earliest memories, whether it be like a, a classic console or even in the arcade scene? Okay. So like, I mean, my grandmother had, um, my grandmother worked for the Home Shopping Network, so back in whatever era this is, and uh, she actually got the NES. And I still okay. remember, you know, going to her house. She had the NES, and she had Duck Hunt, and she had a Super Mario Brothers. And she would show me, oh, and Tetris. 
and she would show me like, oh, this is really right. cool. Can't forget Tetris. Yeah. And she had this, it was like really cool. And she had all this stuff set up. And then what happened was um, she really got into Wheel of Fortune. I guess there was a Wheel of Fortune game for it at one point in time or something like that. Or maybe it was another console, but she hmm. got into Wheel of Fortune. And uh, that was like my first memory of it. Then the second memory would be like um, the, the arcade uh, machines. And it was uh, in Bay Harbor right. Island where I grew up in Miami. And there was a laundromat we would go to every Sunday, you know, after church to go to the laundromat to do laundry because we didn't have a lawn, you know, washer and dryer in our house. And we would, <laughs> my mom and dad would hand me like, oh, here's 50 cents. And there was, I still remember, dude, there was a Mortal Kombat 1 cabinet right next to a Galaga cabinet. And they were both branded cabinets, you know, like legit branded cabinets. And I would just, I always really, really did poorly at Mortal Kombat, especially Mortal Kombat 1. I did really, really poorly at that. And then what happened was um, I got more addicted to like Galaga. So my dad was always really a fanatic with Galaga and he kind of showed me the ropes. And that was probably my first introduction um, at a very young age to Mortal Kombat 1 and Galaga. Then jump a couple years forward, you know, in high school and all that kind of stuff, we had, you know, obviously the Xbox and the Playstations. But the first console that I remember receiving myself was the Costco. I don't know. Do you guys have Costco's up there? Like Costco? Yeah, we do have Costco. Okay, so it was a Costco bundle package yep. for PlayStation 1. And I still remember it. Career, I still have the PlayStation. Okay. It was a bundle package. It came with Crash Bandicoot, and it came with Blasto. And uh, we got it for Christmas, my sister and I. And we had those two games. And then that kind of, like, segued me into my own consoles. Um, you know, I got PlayStation 1, then I got PlayStation 2, and then all my friends started getting everything else. So, you know, during high school, I graduated in 03. So um, during high school, you know, they had Xbox. We used to play N64 uh, Torak, the Dinosaur Hunter game or whatever, in like history yep. class. We used yep. to play that. Um, Halo, <laughs> Halo on the Xbox. My friends and I would do like a weekend long um playthroughs like we played through like entire like jedi power battles an entire weekend without stopping and um and uh, we did stuff like that so that kind of brings you all the way up to like where we are right now and um and then i started getting into building my own arcade cabinets using different like emulated systems and things like that just to kind of get in the habit see if i could do it and um that kind of say wait we segued us into where we are today Gotcha. So you were doing like MAME cabinets and stuff? Yeah. Running hyperspin. Like Raspberry Pis? Oh. Uh, gotcha. Hyper, yeah. You know, hyperspin's a little bit more like intense on the processing. So like you you Raspberry Pis couldn't really handle it too well. So I just took like old Dell computers and just started like manipulating them and adding the ROMs and understand how the marquees work versus, you know, well, you know, versus the controls. And then obviously having Flynn's and doing, I would say about about 80% of the repairs all ourself, I began to understand flybacks and, you know, power supplies and buttons and joysticks and all this other stuff. So that's what we got into, man. It's crazy. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a never ending hole. You just get in there and you just, you keep working, keep learning things. And there's always more to do, um, especially with all the arcade games that have come out in the past. Um, I'm curious that. about um, you guys having this arcade side to the business, which mm -hmm. is pr the primary part of the of business right the arcade yep. mm -hmm. the arcade gotcha. so what do you guys own all of your machines or yes. do you go through operators in the area no no i own i we own every single machine other than um our everybody kept asking for a pinball and as you know pinballs are a heck of a lot of cash and yeah. there are a lot of maintenance and being they're, yeah they're the, very finicky oh i mean you have a little steel ball flying around at 40 miles an hour you know i mean stuff's gonna break <laughs> Um, so right. I talked to one of the, one of our uh, back, actually our main arcade tech who handles stuff that we, I can't handle, or we can't handle. Um, his name is Neil and Neil's like, dude, I got a, I got a Deadpool pinball. Let me put it in here. And then we do a route on that particular machine. But other than that, every other machine gotcha. we own, um, we own, and we are constantly in the process of like, you know, buying new machines or what I predominantly like lean towards more like. I buy machines that need a little love and then put the love back into them and then, you know, bring them into Flynn's. And I also sell machines too. So like we, 
well, I'll find one that I want to have in the arcade for a little while. I'll put it for sale. And then, hey, when it sells, it goes out. And then I use the cash to buy another machine. Gotcha. Yeah, so you've always got a, a fresh cycle of games in there, which is a really, really good move. Yeah, and we go for very high replayability. Gotcha. Can you go a little bit deeper into um, how you guys started the arcade? Um, like what it looked like going from nothing to the arcade opening and what kind of advice you would give people that are interested in also opening an arcade, like things to avoid? Okay, for sure, man. No worries. Um, so the first thing is I always recommend is you got to come up with a very strong business plan. And there's, there's a bunch of simple websites. Literally, if you Google like simple business plan, and um, I believe the website that we predominantly use is called The Balance. And they have a very simple outline that kind of helps you uh, finite, you know, your mission statement, your personas, meaning who will you serve, because you can't serve everybody, who you will serve, um, your right. financial breakdowns, your, um, you know, your marketing, your branding, your, your uh, company culture handbook, your branding guide, you know, so you stay on, on, on brand, on target. And um, that's the first step. Definitely, I, I, I reiterate always, go into your business plan hardcore, ready to rock and roll in terms of uh, this is what you need, you know, this is what you need to write down and this is what you need to accomplish. That business plan is going to change a lot. And you got to be ready for that. Just because you have a vision in your mind does not mean that it's, it's going to ever go that way. Um, and then also, uh, you have to, I mean, I do have a business partner, Will. And um, you have to, if you're going to take a business partner on, you have to take a business partner on that makes up for the weaknesses that you have. I've seen a lot of business partners right. kind of like, you know, piggyback off each other and they're both in the same exact boat. And I'm like, well, if you have the both the same strengths, you know, who's making up for your weaknesses? So I didn't really have the general contractor knowledge behind me um, that Will had with his dad. And so that helped out tenfold because, I mean, labor expenses are radically high. I mean, they can make upwards of, you know, 40, 50, 60 percent of your build out cost. So that definitely is once right. again in your financials, you're going to have a really good idea of what your breakdown is going to be for your um, for your build out. You know, so business plan, your numbers, dig into that hardcore. Um, the other thing I recommend definitely is to financially figure out where this money is going to come from. Um, you know, is it going to be something you're going to save up for? Is it going to be something that you're going to look to finance? Is it going to be something that you're going to, uh, you know, borrow money from, you know, like, are you going to do a home equity line of credit? I mean, what are you going to do? Um, and I recommend once you have that number in place, like, let's say it's $30,000. Once you have that number in place, triple it because there are things that are going to come up that are going to be like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. So um, since that's the case, you'll be kind of prepared, prepared for the storm. Uh, so your finances. The other thing is time frames. A lot of people set very optimistic time frames, when in reality, the wheels of government and, and, and approvals and occupancy certificates, they take a million times longer than you would anticipate. Um, yeah. So you got to be once again, ready to ride the storm. Because of my real estate background, I was familiar enough with commercial leasing and understanding what was involved with that. Um, you know, first, last, and security. Is there CAM involved, which is common area maintenance, or is it CPI? How do they, you know, how, what kind of lease are they looking for? How long has it been there? And that kind of segues into your demographics. Um, you know, the one thing I've seen a lot of people do is they have greatest intentions, but they want to serve everybody. And I'm like, okay, well, I understand that and I appreciate it. But in reality, who is your key demographic? And if, if your key demographic is X, Y, Z, then you need to go to where X, Y, Z is, or at least where they can get to. We're, we're very blessed, man. We're in a high metropolitan area, South Florida. We're between both counties, Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami. I mean, we have very high density population. Um, we have good street exposure. That's one thing. You know, parking is another thing. Um, you're going to want to understand like, insurances and liability and zoning is a huge thing a lot of a lot of realtors do a very poor job in let's say you have somebody thinking to start an arcade well they're going to go out and look for commercial space then they're going to interact with the realtor the realtor might be like oh yeah for sure let's sign this lease now you sign it because you're all excited understandably 
And then you go to the zoning department of that city. And then the city says, oh, no, you can't be here. We don't allow indoor entertainment here. And they're like, what? What do you mean? I, you can't, I can't, you know, we don't allow indoor entertainment. Yeah, it's not zoned for that. So checking out the zoning is, is vitally important. And honestly, what I've uh, begun to do uh, unknowingly is that a lot of people are beginning to contact us directly. They're thinking about starting arcades and they're like, hey, can I ask a few questions? And dude, we're an open book. So anybody listening to this, you know, our contact information will probably be somewhere. So reach out to us um, or find us on Google or whatever. And I'm more than happy to, to speak of any, uh, any, any, comments, any comments or questions you have. But I would say that the biggest pitfall that a lot of people have had is that when you begin to develop a business, you have to, um, you have to build that business for the community in which you're trying to serve. And you have to really understand that right. it's not about you, it's about them. And who cares if like, dude, I'll be honest, I don't know really a lot about like, you know, modern fighting games, Mortal Kombat 11 or Smash Ultimate. I don't play them very much, but dude, our community wants it and we can organize tournaments around it and we find people that are familiar with the game enough and we give them what they want. And that seems to be a really big pitfall because uh, a lot of people I've spoken to, bro, they're just like, oh yeah, I have this idea and this idea and this idea. I'm like, yeah, but have you pulled your community? What do you mean? Like, have you gone out and find what these people really want so you can give them what they want? We were doing, um, we were doing meet and greets before we even opened. We would have like these pot pizza parties at a local pizza parlor. And I would just ask them questions. Say, hey, what do you think about this pricing, uh, you know, pricing idea? What do you think about this event? Or what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? And of course, you can't take everything. But I would definitely say, think about the community. There's a great book by Seth Godin called This Is Marketing. And it's a very small book. It's orange. That book radically assisted me in, in better shaping my idea when it comes to marketing and it comes to community and what it really means to be a part of a community. So, dude, it's all about community, man. That's the biggest pitfall I've seen people fall into. Right. And I completely agree with that. I mean, just through making the podcast, every handful of episodes, I'll get someone that gives me a suggestion. Sometimes they're great suggestions. Sometimes they're not that great. But I mean, it's it's taken me from just having an equalizer over the video to having gameplay, which how are you going to listen to someone talk about a game and not know what's happening, especially if you're watching it on YouTube, to right. even now this being the first podcast that I actually record video on. Um, yeah. The, the community Indeed, is everything segue. and you can't grow without it. You can't no. grow without it. Nope. You cannot grow without it. And that's, that's when you usually see it begin to, to, um, to like falter, you know, like this wibble wobble, if you will, when businesses begin to do that with their, with their, with their structure, where all of a sudden they, they lose track of who they are and what their community stood for. And then they're faltering and they're grabbing for straws. And then unfortunately, most of them meet their demise because they lose focus of that goal. Right. Right. So I guess my next question for you um, is a little bit, they're, they're kind of together. So I'll ask them as one question. Okay. Um, what sets you guys apart from other arcades? And I know one of the big things is events. So just after you answer that, what kind of events do you guys run? Okay. So what sets us apart? And, and I'm going to relay back also to your previous question is that you have to know your competition, right? You have to know who's out there and what's out there. So when Will and I started this, bro, we traveled all the way from Orlando, all the way down past where we're at. And we visited every arcade slash gaming place we could. We took scrupulous notes. We wrote down notes about the demographic. We note, wrote down notes about their pricing. We took pictures. We, we documented the whole thing. And that really allowed us to understand how we could differentiate. And because in Southeast Florida, we have um, Arcade Odyssey down in Miami, in Kendall. They're about an hour away from us. Yep. Um, the group down there, totally cool. They run really, really modern systems. Like they run the brand new initial D games. You know, they run the brand new rhythm games. They're okay. dumping loads of cash into equipment, you know, but they operate on the Coinbase system. And that's something that I didn't want to do. Um, because in Florida, when you deal with coins, it's the part of gambling and then taxation is totally different. And then it, there's a lot of oversight. And then also, um, as you know, when you got a coin receptacle in there, bro, you got a lot of you, things can get lodged in there. You're dealing with more like customer service. And yep. I know I knew we were going to run a small ship at the beginning. I'm like, dude, I can't have all these variables. 
So that's arcade. That's down in Miami. Then we have some, um, let's call them barcades. I guess that's the word we look for, or, or arcade bar, you know, bars that are themed arcade. Um, and we have a couple. We have one about 20 minutes north of us, 15, 20 minutes north of us. We have another one, you know, 20, 25, 30 minutes uh, uh, east of us. But they all cater to more of that drinking, you know, the alcohol is the main focus. And they, they just happen to have arcade games, you know? Yeah, I know. I've. I've yeah, spoke glitch. to uh, Arcade Monsters and Glitch Bar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, you know, there's alcohol there. You can tell that's their moneymaker and they're doing it and they're owning it. Hey, that's totally cool. Hey, you got to do what you got to do. Um, but when I, when, we, when, we, when, when I started thinking about this idea of the arcade, before I even talked to Will about it, I, I obviously you, you get where the name is from, right? Flynn's? Um, it might have gone over my head. Tron. Fill me in. It's from Tron. Oh, duh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I just watched that like a week ago. I can't believe that I didn't put that together. So Flynn's is from Tron. And um, and I always said, if I open up an arcade or some sort of gaming related thing, I'm going to give homage to those who have come before. And, you know, Legacy and the old Tron are are like one of my, two of my favorite movies. So, um, mm. so that being said, I, I would always ask myself, if I was Kevin Flynn, the creator of The Grid, who who would I want in my arcade? Who would I want? And then I reverted back to those scenes in the movie where you see the arcade and it's everybody. You know, you got young, you got old, you got families, you got single, you got this, you got that. And then I said, okay, well, that's a good start. But like we're talking back, you got to know your community. So I, I started kind of creating the demographic and we found that we really service from about 25 to 44, predominantly male. Um, and, and then we serve that bracket. And it kind of serves exactly what I was thinking, where you have the people that are young who think it's, you know, who, who never really got a you know, very exposed to it. And they're like, they heard about it, but they never seen it. Then you got this interesting group, let's say 35 to 40. They got kids now. They had it when they were a kid and they want to show their kids it. And then we also have the demographic of right. the, 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 the older one who doesn't have a family, but I call him Nostalgic Nick. That's the name of the persona, Nostalgic Nick. They had this when they were younger. They want to relive it now. And so we offer that. And so... That's really the, the demographics, the personas we, we use. And, and the big thing too is we run a pay to enter model. So everything is set to free play other than the pinball game because we don't own that machine. Um, it's $15 unlimited, play as right. long as you want, come and go as you please for the entire day we're open or $10 an hour. And so that's how we really designed this, this rhythm. And the reason why also is because I always thought of it like the price of a movie ticket. You know, you have to give your your customer base something they're comfortable with. You can't charge too much, but you can't charge too little. Um, and so we said, okay, fifteen dollars is kind of a sweet spot, at least for the first couple of years. That will work. And um, really, it's been received very, very well. People love it because, dude, when you go to we have them down here. You know, like Boomers or Dave and Buster's, where they're massive conglomerate arcades, bro. It's swipe, 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 swipe. Two hundred dollars later, and twenty minutes later. You're like, what happened? Easy, you know? easy $200. Yeah, dude, you're like, what happened? I yeah. call them gotchas. That's what they are. They're gotchas. You, you can't go in there and play for a half hour for less than 40 bucks. <laughs> exactly. They're gotchas, bro. Like I mean, that money gotcha. that money burns so fast. <laughs> and, and the thing is, whenever you have a business that forces you to convert real cash to Tinder, to, to, their, to their artificial currency, you always have to ask yourself, something is probably happening here. There's, I'm getting screwed somehow, right. you know? So... Um, but, you know, people like it and hey, if it works for them, totally cool. But we wanted to roll with the idea of the pay to enter model. And then we segued. And that's really kind of what sets us apart. But I would say that's one element. The bigger cog in the greater machine, uh, jo is it you like jo Joseph, right? The bigger cog in the in the in the bigger. Yeah, machine, you can call bro, me Joseph. Oh, uh, Joseph. Awesome. The, the bigger cog, bro, is community and family. I said, all comes to fail, we're always going to revert back to this mantra of it's about the community, the Flynn's family, as we call it, have you probably seen on social media, the Flynn's family, it's about that first. So if anything begins to affect this main cog in the machine, the Flynn's family to, you know, rub or whatever, then we need to call attention to it and revert back to the original ways, because obviously it's not working. So that's definitely a segue into the events. We do a lot of events. We try to do um, we try to do at least one event a month and then we try to do one big event a quarter. And the thing with events, they range from I'll give you an example. We've done, uh, stuff for veterans day where veterans play for free. We've done, uh, things for teacher appreciation day. 
We've done things for um, uh, what's it called? Uh, w- when we had signings, we have signings. We had Dominic Pace with us from Mandalorian. He did a signing. We did a Star Wars theme night. We do an event called Cosplay Fan Fest, which is a cosplay centric event because our cosplay community, they are, you know, they're very dear to us. Same way with our Gundam, our, our Warhammer, our arcade enthusiasts, our tournament players, be it tabletop gaming or consoles, um, our cosplayers, our families in general. We have family fun days. And um, we always kind of reshape it. And in 2021, our goal, bro, mm-hmm. is, hey, every event has to have a twist. It can't be the same thing we used to do, same thing we did last year. It has to have a twist. So for example, for our Valentine's Day event, February 13th, we celebrated it the day before because I wanted the couples to have the ability to celebrate you know, on their own on the 14th. So we did uh, sushi. Right. So I had sushi being made at Flynn's. Uh, we did $7 rolls, which is like super affordable, all fresh, all, all super awesome. And then I'm all big on relationships. So we have developed a relationship with Saki, uh, Soto Saki, S-O-T-O Saki. And we, I, I asked them, hey, would you be do- willing to donate a couple of bottles of your premium Saki where we could do Saki tastings for those over 21? Because we do serve alcohol, but I always compare it to Chuck E. Cheese. They serve alcohol at Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> so it's really not anything different. Um, and right. uh, we did, we did, we did a, a sushi and then the sake tasting alongside that. We always do, like the shirt I'm wearing right now, this is not live screen printed, but we always do free live screen printing. You might have seen that, where we'll either have the community, the Flint's family develop a design, and then I have a lot of contacts and friends in the screen printing, or if there's an up and coming screen printer, a printing company, um, they'll come up, they'll set up for two hours, usually seven to nine, totally free screen printing. They just got to bring, you just got to bring a shirt or they'll have a shirt to purchase and they'll print on anything, a bag, an apron, whatever. Um, we always do that. We always have boba, which I make personally um, because I just didn't find the quality I wanted. So, um, you know, we do boba and then, um, dude, we do different events. We do build and paint nights on Thursday nights at eight o'clock. Uh, where we come together and we do building for Gundam or Warhammer or Dolls or D&D. We do D&D Wednesdays at 7 o'clock, Dungeons and & Dragons. And um, we do, now we're starting to do Warhammer um, because we're segueing, because we're expanding right now, um, Joseph, we're expanding to an additional 2,000 square feet. So we'll be just under 4,000 square feet in total. So the arcade will make up 16, well, about 1,700 square feet of the whole thing. Then this other space, I call it my cafetornasium. The cafetornasium will be my flex space. So it'll allow us to A, grow the console gaming uh, tournament, B, hopefully integrate PC gaming because we have a couple things in the works right now um, that I'm super stoked to announce here shortly. Once they solidify where we're going to be segueing into PC gaming and, and leagues and professional tournaments. And then also I want to have the space, what I call the creator space, which, you know, the Gundam Builder. I mean, I'm a very, very big Gundam builder. And the thing that happens is, as you've probably seen, my cats behind me, we have quite a few animals that we rescue and Gundam are little, really small pieces. And I can't really set up here at the house. So yeah. we want to have a space where people can come and rent out a little locker and store their stuff there and allow them the ability to do that and also provide the tools that they may not have access to, like airbrushes or Dremels or, you know, whatever the case may be. So, dude, yeah, we, we, we do. It, it may sound that we are kind of convoluted, But the mentality that we focus on is number one community. And also I ask myself this question, as long as it circles around the video games, arcade games and tabletop centric. Now we will probably never, we, I won't say never, but we probably, it'd be highly unlikely for us to start selling, selling like hot toys because I don't really want that on my shelf. It doesn't make sense. But when you come in there, it's like, that's why it says Flynn's arcade and more. Because I wanted that more, so it's open ended, so I could do whatever I wanted later on, and um, and it's really cool, man. We're blessed by it. We're very fortunate. Yeah, I mean, it it sounds like you guys do a lot, and it's really cool that you do all that. Um, and the tournaments. Talk to me a little bit more about the tournament that you're running this weekend. Okay. Um, and what other kind of tournaments you've run in the past? Okay, so before COVID, right? Before COVID, um, we were running. We run three tournaments a week. We were running a combination of Mortal Kombat 11 on PS4, Tekken 7, PS4, Street Fighter 5, PS4, Smash Ultimate, Switch, and Melee on the CRT tubes, either on the Wii or the GameCube. 
And we were peppering in some anime fighters. Guilty Gear, Undernight. Um, we also did Dragon Ball Z Fighters. Um, and some, you know, unusual games here and there. Um, uh, like, you know, really old stuff like Mar like uh, Dr. Mario and things like that. Which you really didn't come to flourish in, but that's what we were thinking. And we also run Mario Kart 8 Deluxe on the Switch. And we also have run Mario Kart 64. So before COVID, we would, we would allot Friday, Saturday, Sunday tournaments. And we were averaging, because remember, we had just gotten started. So we were averaging between 10 to 15 participants per tournament. It was really great. It was growing. Then, boom, COVID hits, right? And we were shut down from March 18th to May 18th, roughly. And what we did during that time is I would, I would go and do streaming with everybody. Like, we would play Call of Duty or Warzone together, and we get people at, and I'm not good at it, bro. I enjoy it. I'm not good at it. So I would just have fun with it. <laughs> and make, you know, like I would just have like, yeah, people be like, Eddie, you're going the wrong direction, you know, like whatever. And, or I would do, or they would put VR on me. They put a PS4 VR, like the silent hit or not uh, the resident evil. And I mean, I would just have fun with it or right. guitar hero or whatever. And what I noticed was during that time, the people that played on PlayStation 4, because PlayStation 4's online platform is a lot stronger. It's not perfect, but it's a lot stronger than Switch, you know? Nintendo's kind of, eh. Um, right. And uh, when we- They're still we, working on it. They're, yeah, yeah, there's, <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Um, so what I noticed was a lot of the, the other fighters, very hit and miss and sporadic, because right when we rolled out in May, we began doing the same thing we were doing before. And I was like, dude, this is not working, because we were doing Smash every other weekend. And I'm like, listen, the Smash community is loyal. They want this. They want to come out. We were doing the tournaments. <laughs> we were actually, we actually run the tournaments outside Flynn's, like literally outside under on the sidewalk. That's where we run the tournaments. So <laughs> the reason why is because there's so many players. I was like, this is not really safe to have them all crowded together <laughs> right now. So we moved it outside. Um, you know, it's Florida, so it's really not that bad. And if it's raining or whatever, we do it inside and we work out like, you know, we call people with the PA system. Hey, it's your turn to compete or whatever. And um, we play Smash Ultimate. So we now we do weekly Smash Ultimates on Saturday. And that group is really thriving and growing, man. It's a blessing. Um, we average between... Hang on two seconds, bro. My cats are going crazy. Hang on a second, bro. One hour later. All right. Sorry about that, bro. You might have to edit that out. So I'll wait You're a second. I've, I've got two cats. I, I rescued a cat about, <laughs> oh, God, it's been like three or four months now. And she was about six months old. And seven weeks after having her, she was giving birth. Oh, my God. no idea. Oh, so dear, we, dear. we got another kitten. <laughs> yeah, ours are, ours are, we love them to death, but they're definitely, you know, some get along, some don't get along. And you know how it is, bro. So, yeah. um. So what, what I was saying, oh, so Smash Ultimate. So yeah, so Smash Ultimate, bro, they were really dedicated. They were totally into it. And we just started rolling weekly Smash tournaments, you know, every Saturday, 7 p.m. And then I wanted to start segueing into Melee because our Melee community down here, Smash Melee, for those of you who may not know what I'm talking about, Smash Melee, they, they're they really strong down here. And um, unfortunately, bro, we had a couple, um, about three, I believe three, uh, gaming type arcade video game plays is shut down down here. Um, they they weren't able to make the rents and I talked to the owners. I reached out to them and said, listen, anything we can do to help, let me know. Let's try to get some money together, such and such. And they just said, Eddie, listen, it's time to it's time to call this quits and move on with our life. So that's what they did, homie. And fortunately, bro, they they shut down, unfortunately. And um, and then the melee community is really strong, and we're still working at it. Every Friday at seven o'clock is melee. We were still working on it. We had the CRT tubes and everything like that. But PlayStation, the PlayStation players, the internet was really, really strong, or the, the, the online play is pretty good. So those competitive players kind of like went to more of the online stuff. That's why we Senpai, so back Senpai, um, who's really helped us segue into Twitch and into the streaming and into the tournaments, he suggested, he's like, listen, you guys do a big pot smash tournament every month. Um, it's a $300 pot tournament. Um, why not do a weekend of $300 pot tournaments called Fighter Fest season one, and we'll do Mortal Kombat 11, Smash Ultimate and Dragon Ball Z Fighters. And let's see if we can get the community to come back out. And now when we do, our, when we do tournaments like this, the entry does include the arcade for the night, a drink and entry into the tournament. 
So that's the only way I felt it was fair. It was like, okay, I'm going to charge a higher amount for the entry, but you can enjoy the arcade for the whole night. And it's just, a, you make a night of it. So um, we did that. Right. But once again, with, with as you probably know, with tournaments, bro, you have to run it like professionally. So like we run BenQ monitors, you know, one millisecond response time monitors. We have GameCube adapters. We have all the DLC. We don't have, if we're doing any sort of online element, we have the um, tethered ethernet cables. You know, you can't half heart this, especially you have to listen to, like we were talking about with community. We right. started listening to the Smash uh, community and they said, hey, listen, we need this. Okay, no problem. We have every DLC character. Even if no one plays the character, we still have it because we want to give the opportunity to the kid who doesn't have $5, but has the original Smash Ultimate and they want to try the new Steve or the whatever, you know what I'm saying? We want to give them the opportunity to play that character or to, you know, whatever the case may be. So yeah, man. So that that's that's this upcoming weekend on the nineteenth, twentieth, and twenty first here at Margate, or uh, here at Flynn's and Margate. That should be that should be interesting, bro. I mean, I'm calling out a lot of people. You know, like I'm like, dude, you say you're the best, bro. Like three hundred dollars is up for grabs. Usually, the first prize winner, you know, is about um, you know, seventy to sixty percent of that prize pool. Plus, I like to give out in, what I call intangibles, which I'll give passes the flins or I'll give drinks or a shirt or something. You know what I'm saying? So it's all about community, man, trying to get those people right. out here, bro. Yeah. And that's, that's what everybody's doing right now is trying to get that community together. And we're all, we're all coming out of this. And I know everybody became a little more introverted in the last year. We just <laughs> got to spread our wings again and get out there. <laughs> exactly, bro. Exactly, man. And, and unfortunately, you know, after, and, and I don't know if it applied up there, bro, but af, af, before COVID, before all this stuff really started taking off in March, I, I felt something was coming. And I told my partner and I, I told my partner and we had a discussion. I said, listen, when this happens, if this happens, we are going to be there waving the nerd flag as proudly as we can, as loudly as we can, um, while everybody else is not doing that. Because I come from a military background with my military, I went to a military school and all this kind of stuff. And like, that's like what we do in warfare. You know, when the when the competition is not doing anything, you keep pressing forward as fast and as hard as you can unrelentingly. And you just keep going and going and going and going and going. And um, and uh, and that's what we did, man. And that's what I recommend anyone watching this video, regardless or listening, anyone doing anything, be it a creator, a game manufacturer, developer or whatever. Dude, freaking grind forward. Don't screw. Who cares what everybody else is doing? You know, so, yeah, dude, it's it's cray cray up in here. <laughs> that's the only way I could think of it. Yeah, I mean that's that's very much what the the inspiration was for Indie Arcade Wave is all these developers were just kind of sitting back and there wasn't really anything we could do. You know, it's nobody's buying arcade cabinets when arcades aren't open. So I figured I would just get people on here and let them tell their stories and see what we can do and see what we can build. Oh dude, you're you're on it. Yeah, the the last question I had for you um, was conventions. Yeah. I just was wondering if there are any conventions that you're looking at down there right now or uh, what you've been to recently. All right. So the convention scene down in Southeast Florida is um, it's coming back little by little. And what we were doing, <laughs> what we were doing before we actually opened, um, I would go out and I would reach out to every convention that I could and say, hey, listen. I'd love to come out, bring a couple arcade machines, introduce myself to the community. So we were going to conventions, bringing machines before we even opened and building that community once again. So now words kind of gotten out where a lot of people reach out and contact us and say, hey, Eddie, you know, could you bring a couple of cabinets out? Or, hey, Eddie, could you run our game room? Or, hey, Eddie. Or if I notice that if I notice they're coming up, I'll probably approach them first. Say, hey, listen, would it be cool? I have this idea. So we went to, we've gone to every convention that has been available in, in 2019 and 2020. Um, we've been to this, this year we did January Otaku Fest, a guy by the name of Winji runs it in Miami. Um, my hat's off to Winji and the crew, dude, they kept everything like, like on point, bro, temperature checks and, and limiting the vendors and masks and hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer. And, you know, dude, there's always going to be haters. After the convention, there was haters. You know, I call them uh, putting turds in the punch bowl, you know, screwing it up for, you know, whatever. Half their stuff was all false. Anyways, so that was the first one. And then we just did this previous, um, not this last weekend, but the weekend before that, we did Super Fan Con in Fort Lauderdale. And we had done Super Fan Con previously in 20, uh, 2020, February. 
And so Super Fan Con was an interesting experience because it was smack dab in the middle of a family entertainment center called Extreme Action Park. You're talking, this thing must be like 120,000 square feet. You know, all the gotcha games and VR and go-kart racing and all this other stuff. It was insanity. Convention was okay. You know, it was decent. Um, but once again, this time I tried something new because it was in an arcade. I said, no, I'm not bringing out my arcade machines. We know them. They know us. I'm not bringing my arcade machines out. I said, I'll bring my consoles. So we brought all types of consoles. I brought my Time Crisis light gun game for PS2. I brought, you know, Smash Melee. I brought all types of older stuff. And I, I bought PS4s and all that kind of stuff. We we helped host a couple of tournaments there also while we were there. Um, and so that's what we did previously. Now, this upcoming, bro, a lot of uh, conventions have pushed back their date further. Um, and we have, uh, we'll be at MizuCon, uh, which is, I believe MizuCon is in Fort Lauderdale. And that's probably, I think, like August or something like that. And the date escapes me. And then we'll also be doing Anime EY, most likely. And that's, I believe, in July. Um, there's a couple other conventions coming up, I think, in in September. There's a couple other ones coming up and, um, you know, we'll do anything within our tri-county area. And that's what I recommend to any person that's thinking about attending the conventions. Don't go attend a convention four hours from your location. The likeliness of a customer or a community member going that far is really highly unlikely, unless you're trying to build some sort of brand awareness, like there's another facet to your business. So that's what we got, dude, for, for the time for, you know, for what we, what we got planned. And then of course, <laughs> Because of our expansion and my cafetornasium, and the reason why I'm saying cafetornasium is because in middle school, I don't know if you had it, but we had it where it was one giant building. It was like our cafeteria, our gymnasium, and our auditorium all together. And so our cafetornasium, if you will, is about- Did not have that, but wow, that sounds like a lot. Right, yeah. <laughs> so it was a lot. Um, when you want to play basketball, you got to put the chairs up, you know, <laughs> like you got, and when we have ceremonies, you got to put that <laughs> basketball court up. It was- it was insanity, bro. I went to small private schools growing up. So um, that's usually how they roll. Uh, but with this area, this flex space, if you will, I plan to bring back, um, you know, uh, mini cons. I'm going to call them Flynn cons, where we'll do Flynn cons around specific genres. So we might have a table, a table card con. We might have a, um, so we plan to have we plan to have like these centric cons where we'll have like tabletop gaming or sneakers or whatever we want to do for the community. Once again, once the community talks about it, that's a big thing that we want to focus in on. And then also we'll have, um, you know, I want to start doing build nights, you know, our build contest for the Gundam and the Gunplus stuff because we're really into that. Um, but yeah, dude, that's what we're excited for, man. I mean, I'm really hoping and praying because what's happening now, we're running out of space, bro. Like we are running out of space. Like when we, when we do our events, when we, when we did our, when we did our cosplay event, we were super blessed, man. We had like, let's just put it, we had a lot of people, you know, like we had a lot of people come out and it, I felt kind of like, ah, because I had to have people outside, you know, I, I couldn't, I didn't want to risk it. Right. So we kept, we kept numbers really low on the inside and we kept calculation of in, out, in, out, in, out, of course, hand sanitizer, mask, bathrooms, all that good stuff. But um, I'm really looking forward to having an indoor space where we can do anything I want. You know? <laughs> like... So that's gotcha. what we got going on, man. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like you guys have a lot of a lot of plans for the future, and I, I like to hear that. Um, I guess to wrap everything up, just uh, plug the social media so people know where to find you. Oh, for sure, dude. So we are on every social media platform you could probably think of. So predominantly Instagram and Facebook and TikTok. Uh, YouTube, Twitter, um, Google, Google My Business. We have the website. Uh, it's at Flynn's Gaming FL. So Flynn's F L Y N N S Gaming, G A M I N G F L, like for the state of Florida. And uh, if you Google that, or if you go to um, Flynn'sGaming.com, our information's there as well uh, with everything we kind of orchestrate and do. And then, of course, if you want to stop by, we're located at 5869 Margate Boulevard in Margate, Florida, 33063. And we're open every day of the week other than Mondays. Uh, Mondays, today is the day we use for repairs and maintenance and cleaning. And because we're segueing into Warhammer, <laughs> the guys are there right now playing Warhammer. So they're there till midnight tonight. And then we also do our own stream there 
as well. Um, let's talk Gunpla with Uber's Cosplay, and then let's talk Warhammer as well um, on our social media channels, like Twitch also, at Flynn's Gaming FL. So that's where they can find us, dude. And, and if anyone has any questions or comments or anything they want to talk about or anything at all, you know, we're an open book. I mean, I'm not hiding anything, and, and I want everybody to feel comfortable to come in and ask questions if they want to ask questions. Awesome. Well, I just want to thank you again, Eddie, for coming on here. Um, if you guys like what we're doing here at Indie Arcade Wave, for don't sure, forget dude. to subscribe, like, and share. Um, you can find us on all the social medias as well. And that's a wrap here. So until next time, peace. Peace.